Welcome to the Power of Your Voice podcast with your host, Johnny Gorky. You have the power to overcome challenges and fears. Let my voice and the voice of many others show you how to transform these challenges into opportunities. To learn more about future podcasts and read episode show notes, check out my website at www.thepowerofyourvoice.com. Hey guys, it's Johnny. Thank you for being a loyal listener of the Power of Your Voice podcast. I appreciate you for taking a moment out of your busy day to listen. This is episode 38 with Joanne Darkity, who is a consultant, corporate trainer, motivational speaker, servant leader, deeply passionate about Africans' social, economic, and infrastructural development. Joanne co-founded Liberia Economic Development Initiative, also known as LEDI, a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission to reduce poverty and change lives in her native Liberia, West Africa. LEDI's flagship project, currently underway, is to build the first modern public library in post war Liberia. Since 2007, LEDI has awarded over 500 scholarships to youth throughout Liberia provided micro grants and business training to FEMA rock rushers, has donated thousands of dollars worth of financial grants and medical supplies to donations to hospitals and clinics in Liberia and much more. Joan has also been employed by the Federal Reserve System since 2007 in divisions including banking, supervision, regulation, and the Board of Corporate Secretary, legal, and in her current role as Records and Information Management Consultant and Senior Analyst. Prior to working for the Federal Reserve System, she worked for organizations including CNN, Turner Broadcasting, Emory University, and the Georgia Department of Agriculture International Trade Division. Joanne Darkety holds a bachelor's degree in political science from Emory University, a paralegal degree from Clayton State University, and an executive MBA from Monte Ahuja College of Business at Cleveland State University. She also has served on numerous boards, including the ARMA International, Atlanta Chapter, and Cleveland State University Alumni Board most recently. Joanne was recognized as Crane's Cleveland Business 40 Under 40, awarded the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta's Corporate Citizen Award, and a lifetime membership in Beta Gamma Sigma International Business Honor Society. She's married to Rufus Darkety, Letty co-founder and president, and is the mother of two boys, Rufus Jr., and Jeremiah. Joanne, welcome to the Power of Your Voice podcast. I'm so glad to have you here today. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you. You're welcome, Joan. I want to ask you, what is Shiro? I've never heard that term before. A Shiro? Yes. What is a Shiro? I <laughs> watched one of your videos and you're talking about a Shiro. Yeah. So thanks for watching that. Uh, I would consider a Shiro um, the many, many brave women, and in the context that you saw the video, um, many, many brave women of the world who um, do amazing feats every day and balance so many wonderful things from being a working mom to, you know, being CEOs of companies. And these people are not all people who have a day job or not, but it's just about being able to balance all that they do in a way that, um, in a way with integrity um, and that garners admiration from people like myself. So one example of a Shiro, like I talked about in one of the videos, is my mother. She's a nurse and she has been one of those women who has not only cared for her family, but care for communities of children and of people at a time and, um, and then served in the church and, you know, just multiple roles um, and inspiring so many people, especially those who are not even her own children and people in the community and people in the church to be the very best self. So that's how I describe a Shira. I know it's a little long winded, but they're just remarkable women doing remarkable things. So your mom, she was your big role model and a big leader for you. Absolutely. One of many, but definitely the one of the most essential in my life. Um, growing up, I was the only child for a while, and so there was a point in time it was mostly me and my mom. My father worked a lot, so we spent a lot of time together, um, and so watching her, she has the patience of an angel. Um, she also, you know, is one of those people, because she's a nurse, um, she 
heals people. She knows how to soothe and so forth. So I've just learned a lot from her. And then she's wicked wise. You know, she has the, she has um, a lot of wisdom. And so I've picked up on some of her wisdom. And I remember being very young and people would say, you know, how do you know that? Or you speak like an older lady. I'm like, yeah, because I'm in good company. So, <laughs> so what would you say are some amazing things that you learned about leadership from your mother? Well, one of the things I learned is that um, leadership is service. Um, and I learned that at a very early age, not just from my mother, but from my father. Both of them are people who have always demonstrated leadership throughout my life. Um, my father um, in so many ways as well. And so, and I can go into any of those, but I learned lessons like um, the importance of integrity. Um, I learned the importance of sacrifice. I learned the importance of doing the right thing the right way and with excellence. And those are things that I teach my children as well. But most of all, I think I've learned from my parents that it's not about the person with the fancy title. It's about the person who's willing to get the job done, who's willing to serve others with humility. And so I've seen my parents get burned at times, get taken advantage of because they did serve with humility. But I think in the grand scheme of things, they're some of the most blessed people I know because you know, ultimately you'll end up on the right side when you do things the right way and you serve others with integrity. Now, some people, they're like, well, you know, yeah, just like with your example with your parents, hey, you know, I want to serve other people, but I'm worried that people are going to use me. Like they use that as an, as an excuse. So how do you use that as an example, but to like break through that? So there's a couple of things. The, one of the first ways I look at it is there's something called wisdom and you get wisdom by experience. And so we can't change the nature of other people, but we can change how we um, in turn react to the experiences that we've had. And so um, as you gain an experience, you become a fool if you repeat the exact same interaction the exact same way. So maybe you will adjust if you know the person is prone to lying or to taking advantage of people, then you may adjust the way in which you interact with them so that you make sure that whatever mistake was made, that you own responsibility for your part. And your part may have just been the naivety and not having a certain guard up or having you know, a contract if it was something like being deceived by you know, taking someone at their word um, or you know, other things. So that's, that's one aspect. I think another aspect is, um, you know, having discernment and some people call it street smarts, um, building that up over time too, so that you know that everyone is not your assignment, right? So I had that heart to serve, but I had to learn the hard way that I'm not called to be there for everyone. And so having discernment to know who I need to help, who I need to be there for. And sometimes it takes intuition. Other times it takes prayer. But at, at some point, just knowing that you're not the savior. And I think that that was one of the greatest things that I've learned. I'm not, you know, the Messiah. There are people who I do have it in my power to help. And I have been, you know, what I would call assigned to. And those are the people I focus on and I do my part with them. And then realizing that you're, you know, you're human and you can't do it all. And so you do your part and you leave the rest, you know. And so um, one of the last things I would say about, you know, not getting burned is in addition to, you know, having discernment and building off of your experience is, is also knowing that things will happen, but it doesn't take away from the value of what you've done. You cannot, and, and I'm a Christian, so that's my worldview. And I don't think that you can be used by anybody if you're being used by God. So I say that meaning if I'm doing what I believe that my creator called me to do, then I'm at his service and it's not about that person. It's about being obedient to what I've been called to do. So my reward will come from my being true to my calling and my purpose. Through your leadership, what have you learned through your own leadership and when did you realize you were a leader? Oh, wow. So I've, I've had, and I, I keep on referring to my parents because so much of what I've learned about leadership comes from them. Very, very young. I knew I was a leader because my parents told me maybe two or three, I don't know, but it was very, very young. Uh, my, my, my father would remind me every day that I'm a leader. 
you know, he said, you're the best, you know, and, and just re- my parents really did a great job of affirming me and making me feel confident that my voice mattered and so forth. And so as I, you know, whether it was in elementary school, like for example, you, um, I did the Pledge of Allegiance in my elementary school. I did the morning announcements. Even I remember in first grade, I helped the teacher with different assignments. So I've always had and demonstrated leadership abilities and therefore was called. I think the only thing is, as I've grown, like when I was younger, I was I was never shy. Um, per, well, I was shy at a certain time. And then it, it transferred from being shy to more of a private person. So there were times where I didn't want to take the platform and I still have some of that in me today. But I remember, at, particularly in the church, um, there would be times where they would be, you know, some they would ask for someone to do a play or a skit or a recitation, and my mom would be like, "Joanne will do it," and I would look at her with big eyes, like, "No, I won't." No, of course, not saying that, but thinking, "I cannot believe she just did this," you know, like, "Why are you put me out there like that?" But all of those things helped to build my character and my confidence, and with time, it just got perfected because. I started to take on more initiatives. I was on boards in high school. I remember serving on the American Red Cross Youth Board. So none of that I would have done, I think, at a very young age if it weren't for the direction of my parents. They encouraged me to always serve in a leadership capacity, whether at church, whether civically in the community, um, and even in our home. We always had a voice and so forth. So again, um, professionally, um, in, 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 in the corporate world, it's been an interesting um, challenge at times because some organizations are very hierarchical. And if you are a, a lower level employee, title wise, you're not expected to be always a strategic thinker or to demonstrate leadership um, skills. And sometimes it may threaten others. Um, if you have that competency, if you have that experience, wait a minute, you're, you're just intern or you're just an X or a Y, but I have, you know, had to endure that, those looks of, you know, who asked you or, you know, we didn't say, say that, but at the same time, a leader is a leader and you can shrink back, you can try to hold it back, but at the same time, if it's in you, it'll come out. So um, I've, I've been a leader as long as I've known myself. And I think a lot of that has to do with the encouragement um, that my parent, parents gave me at a very young age. I really like that because, yeah, a lot of times you are a person, you're very high strung, you know what you want, you're a go-getter, you're a natural leader, you want to support and help other people, but you might be working in a nonprofit or some corporate American company and you have a boss or there's someone in there and they just, they don't like it the way you are because they're, they're ego. How, how are some ways that you, you didn't allow that to affect you or what would you say to somebody who's listening and they're like, yeah, I'm actually in that current situation. What should I do? Yeah, so I still continue to grow. So this is not advice as if I've you know found the magic um, potion, so to speak. But I have learned a lot of valuable lessons in, over the years. And um, um, some of it has to do with... Um, like I've heard, like I would come home and I would explain to my girlfriend or, you know, my parents or my, you know, my husband or whomever it is. And some of it um, is not what you say, but how you say it. That's feedback that I would get. If you are very, very talented, you're ambitious, and yet people are not, are not as receptive in the business community because of their ego or because you don't have the right title or so forth. There's different approaches depending on the culture of that organization. One approach could be to um, say things in a very, very intentional, non-threatening way. Another approach could be to say, ask, um, ask the statement, <laughs> if that makes sense. By asking the statement, what that means is, I was thinking of X, Y, or Z, what do you think? To give them an opportunity maybe to be the one to say it or to agree or even to invite their dissenting opinion. So that's a technique um, that you can learn making questions and phrasing comments in the form of a question. The other one is not saying your suggestion in a public um, environment, but saying it to that person after the meeting privately or by email so that 
you, you know, you will get credit for what you said. It's documented, but you won't necessarily display that. And I say that, and even as I say that, I shrink a little because we shouldn't have to do that. I just have learned over the years through very valuable lessons that depending on the organization, if you don't learn those techniques, it will stall your career or your ambitions or your drive. While some of these things we may, we, in an ideal world, we wish we didn't have to do, but sometimes you have to do just to get to the next level to where you can be more trusted, more of an influencer, and then have more opportunity to voice without restriction, to have your voice without restriction. And then there's obviously always the entrepreneurial right, route is um, where you still have to be tactful and professional, but at least you have a little bit more leeway in setting the culture of your organization. Very well said. Yeah, because sometimes, like I, I remember hearing a story, it was at 3M, and there was a guy who was just, I think he was like just a regular employee, was not in a management position or whatever. And he came up with the idea for sticky notes. Now, everybody knows what sticky notes are. Right. And thank God that, I don't know if it was like the upper management, the CEO of the company, but he listened to that guy because he had this brilliant idea to take a piece of paper, to put a little glue at the end of it, and people could use sticky notes. Now, that product has probably made 3M hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, there's all different types of sizes and shapes and colors now, but that's why as a manager, CEO, whatever, it's very important to listen to everybody because you don't know what kind of value they, they could bring you. And so I think what you just did was pretty much to define um, like a classic definition of diversity and inclusion. A lot of times when people hear diversity and inclusion, the first thing they think of is, oh, having more minorities or having more X or Y. But in reality, what it is, is having all views at the table and not leaving a single one out. And so it's both hierarchical in terms of you know, different levels of um, different levels of status in an organization, but it's also across cultures and across you know races and and socioeconomic background and you name it, all the different categories um, that that we count to protect. Um, that's that's truly what it's about. How do we make sure that everyone's opinion is included and valued in a way that takes you know, your nonprofit or your organization or your school or whatever it is further. And it's hard because in a lot of organizations, people become what are considered SME, subject matter experts, or considered so by others. And so they become like, they get the badge on their chest and they're the knowledge bearer and everyone defers to them um, as the knowledge keeper, especially if it's a particular subject. The analogy I like to use is, can you catch water? Of course you can't catch water. And in the same way, you can never catch knowledge. Knowledge continues to grow. It continues to flow. It can't be held and contained in a, in a, in a finance, finance space. So in the same way, there is no such thing in reality as a subject matter expert. Yes, you have someone who knows a lot, studied a lot, but it can still be informed by a new thought or a new idea, and its knowledge is ever changing and ever adapting. So for that reason alone, everyone's input um, should be valued because you know you never know. You could have been thinking of things in a particular light, and how one person's comment or even analogy from a different industry can 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 um, give you a different lens of, of dealing with an issue. I like that. That's good. Wanted to ask you, what are three of your greatest achievements, things that you're extremely proud of? <laughs> I'll buckle the first two together. And it's not to say that I've arrived, but I'm really, really proud um, of the fact that of my education, um, I'm, I'm ext I want to get more education and I consider myself a lifelong learner and I love continuous improvement and continuous learning. So that's some, those are values that um, I have and that I pride myself in. But I remember um, I got my undergraduate degree from Emory University and it was a struggle making it out of Emory for particularly because of fi my financial hardship at the time and um, so many things involved there. And then afterwards um, I was groomed, um, per, you know, got a 
um, opportunity to study, get my PhD at Yale, but I, I was really sick and I wasn't able to accept it. And so I, um, a lady at my church told me about a paralegal program. So I got my paralegal degree, but for years I was working um, where I felt stuck. I was working so much below my potential in different jobs, particularly administrative jobs and so forth. And I knew the value that even though they were paying me at a certain salary, um, I knew the value I was bringing to people and the things they brought me in at this lower level, but yet they were asking me to contribute at a much, much higher level because I could. So I always felt this like, wow, you know, I can do more. So I was so happy for the courage. I had applied to law school and I didn't get in, but I applied to um, an executive MBA program. And that was one of the greatest things I ever done. I went in with a chip on my shoulder. There were all these people with big titles. I had the tiniest title um, compared to them. Like we had a state senator in my class. We had a, a, a plant manager. We had um, execs from IBM and, you know, all these big companies. And they were all, like I said, had these huge titles. We had most of the people in our class, the majority were engineers who were looking to enter into management in their organization. Um, everything from um, electrical, not electrical, but um, industrial engineers to, you know, the whole nine. So I felt like, wow. And, and I ended up graduating um, in the top of my class and just excelling in the program. And so that whole experience, it brought my, my confidence back. It taught me a lot of valuable lessons about myself, including the need to not just be a hard individual contributor, but also be a collaborator. Because when you're in your executive MBA program, there's very few things um, there are things that you have to do by yourself, but a lot of the big projects involve collaboration. And so I, I had to learn that. I also had a one-year-old baby at the time. So no sleep at night, tough, challenging situation at work, plus my executive MBA. It was a grinding situation, but I came out the better for it. So that's one of the things I'm most proud of. Another is, you know, and I'll couple them together as well, my husband and my kids, um, because, you know, getting married, having my kids, I'm very, very proud of that. Um, I was very driven and I easily could have gone on single for a very long time. I easily could have just gone from, you know, one ambition to the next, to the next, to the next, um, because I was driven to achieve. Um, but I'm so thankful that things worked out where I was able to get married um, and have children because that's just been the greatest gifts to my life. Um, and then the third thing that I'm very, very thankful for and proud of is my nonprofit. Many times in my career, especially like I, I mentioned, there was some struggles at times, um, either being held back, um, not being fully utilized as a resource in an organization, discrimination. I, I've suffered a lot of different circumstances as we all have you know i'm sure there's there's struggles and battles that every one of us have having the opportunity to have a nonprofit have a board um, run an organization in spite of or in addition to a day job has just been such a light for me but it's not just about the organization and the running of an organization it's also the work the actual work of empowering people and uplifting people there's just something about it. And I, sometimes I felt foolish, like, aren't you supposed to be rich or make a lot of money and then you start a nonprofit and then you try to solve the problems of the world? You haven't even solved your own problems yet and yet you're trying to help people. I felt very foolish. But at the same time, the call was so strong that I wasn't able to turn and shift. As I'm getting older, I'm doing more balance um, to make sure that my desire to help others also matches my desire to help myself and to build a future for my family. My nonprofit work, my service work, it gives me life, it gives me energy. And so those are the three things I can say um, that I'm most proud of. And, and I mentioned my, my, my husband and my kids, but in a bucket, I will call it my family because I, I adore my parents. I adore my siblings. I adore my husband. I adore my children. I just adore my family and my support family system. So those are the three things I am very appreciative of and most proud of. Now I must ask, because there are people who might be listening, they're like, oh my gosh, how 
you have a nonprofit, you have, you're married, you have kids, you're a businesswoman, you have all this stuff going on. Yeah. How do you manage? How are you able to do all this stuff and still have time for the family? How are you still able to serve other people and do all this stuff? Because people will use excuse, well, I, I'm married, I have kids, there's just no way I don't have enough time in the day. How are you able to manage all these things and still be happy in all areas throughout your entire life? It's funny because the, the, short, the, the short, quick and dirty answer is, it's very, very hard. It is. So you're right in your thinking. The other aspect is you drill a little bit more into it is that there are things in life that take your energy and there are things in life that give you energy. And so what you have is this busy, hectic hodgepodge of energy giving and energy taking. And while there's a lot of it, it balances itself because there are some of these activities for taking my energy and some of them are giving me energy. So I hope that helps to understand, but there is no such thing as balance. It's extremely hard, but that's really what it is. Like Just like um, the atmosphere, some things put oxygen in the air and other things put carbon dioxide in the air. Some things put, you know, take oxygen out of the air and some things take um, carbon dioxide out of the air, but it's just perfect balance. And so, or I shouldn't say perfect balance, harmony. There's some type of harmony in it. And I feel like when you're on purpose and you discover your purpose and you think of your purpose, <laughs> how do I say this? Things work out as they eventually should. I say that, and the reason why I hesitated is because I, I used to hate being a youth and 20 something youth. And I would ask an adult who's made it, how did you get to this point or what should I do? And they would always say, follow your purpose. I'm like, yeah, you can say that conveniently because things worked out for you. But what if my purpose doesn't pay my bills? What do I do? And so that's kind of where I found myself in life, where I couldn't just take the advice of someone who says, follow your purpose. Because in fact, at the time, I, my purpose was not able to sustain me and give me a lifestyle and, and help me have insurance for my family and so forth. Not only that, but it may not even allow you to utilize all the skills that you have. So for many reasons, it made sense for me to have a profession, to use some of these skills that I went to school for, um, experience that I've learned from various opportunities that I've, had, that I've had, but then also blend it with my passion, which gives me life, which helps me to cope with the fact that I may not be in an ideal role um, or I may not be um, able to get from behind my desk if I work in a corporate environment or I may not be able to interact with people if I'm crunching numbers. I mean, these are all hypotheticals, but all of that to say that it, it helps to have that balance. And so that's what my experience has been. Good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So I wanted to ask you, speaking of Letty, so why are you so passionate about African social economic infrastructure development? And where do you see Libya through the organization of Lydia in, in say, next five and 10 years? So, yeah, so the organization is Liberia Economic Development Initiative, which is quite different than Libya. But good point and great question, nonetheless. Liberia, I'll give you a little quick and dirty history, was the America's answer to, or one of America's answer to how we're going to deal with the emancipation of free black slaves. So there was an organization called the American Colonization Society that found a piece of land on the coast of West Africa and organized itself amongst, you know, Quakers, amongst free black men um, amongst um, religious leader, people who were former slave owners and slave owners, and all agreed that one solution, that there were many people who believed that Af black slaves should go back to Africa. And so they found this to help people to relocate, but also used Liberia as a strategic place for resources from Africa, uh, many, many resources, intelligence resources, rice. Uh, most people don't know that Firestone Plantation, they get their rubber from um, Firestone Plantation in Liberia. A lot of minerals are, are, are for years and if not centuries have come from Liberia to the United States. So that, that relationship is there. And Liberia descended into a 15 year approximate civil war because it was set up in a way 
modeled completely after United States. The flag is red, white, and blue. They say the I pledge allegiance to the flag of the Republic of Liberia. The capital is Monrovia, named after President James Monroe. And you just go on and on and on. Um, the, the free black men who left this country were from Maryland, were from Ohio, from different places, from Georgia. And when they went to Liberia, they named it New Georgia, Mississippi. All of those places exist in Liberia. Really? And so, yes, yes. So there's a strategic connection, historical connection, and probably more that we haven't even covered yet because very little is, is not very little, but it's, it's not as always, it's not as well taught um, in American history books. But nonetheless, that relationship is there and it's very real. And so Liberia was a formally established as Africa's first independent country in 1847, but it was ruled by what is now known as Americo Liberians, which represented about 5% of the population. And back in the 1800s, um, about 25,000 immigrated from the United States and from the Caribbean and places like that. And again, they had the full black backing of the United States, but there were already people on the land. And when they got there, um, similar to what happened to Native Americans, they squashed the indigenous people. Um, they were not allowed to take part in the, the financial system. They were not allowed to take part in education. And this went on. They were slaves in their own land for over 100 years. And so the situation that you see in Liberia today, where you heard of child soldiers and blood diamonds and all those things, is not just a movie. It happened because of decisions that were made hundreds of years ago or over a hundred years ago, almost 200 years ago. And so I'm very passionate about Liberia because I feel like the, the story needs to be told. And I think the opportunity, there's the opportunity for Americans um, of all stripes to know it and to help Liberia. Um, one of our goals is to bring economic empowerment to the everyday people we also want to bring literacy, which is the bedrock of, of empowerment. If you, if you are illiterate, you're almost automatically disenfranchised. And so we want to bring hope to people, but we want to do so not in a way that is domineering and that suppresses, but in a, in a servant leadership way, right? We've talked about leadership before. Servant leaders are humble. They come in with grace and with love and, and want to help and make a difference. And so when you think about the mission of Letty, our, our mission is reducing poverty and changing lives one child at a time, one book at a time, one library at a time. And so we do that with the help of people, with the help of supporters. And um, I'm traveling in December. I would love for people to come with me to see, find how to make a difference and to really help to correct some of the wrongs that were, you know, it was like a setup that was made to eventually implode. And so when we know the truth, we can act on it. And so that's part of what I hope to inspire people to do. And not everyone can travel to Africa. I would hope that you would want to. It's a very beautiful country. It was devastated by war. So yes, some there's signs of destruction, but it's on the Atlantic Ocean. People travel from all around the world to surf in Liberia. It's gorgeous palm trees everywhere anything you can think of that you put in the ground grows so the vegetation is amazing it's just underdeveloped and so there's a lot of opportunity to make a difference but in a non-exploitative way now how, how do you talk to somebody who's like you know what you're doing is wonderful but say i'm from australia or i'm from poland or argentina or something and you know that I got stuff going on in my country too. Why should I really help out people in other countries? Because it doesn't really help me. Why is it so important that we help other people in other parts of the world as well? So that's a great question. You use foreign countries, but I would say I'm from Georgia or I'm from Ohio. I mean, we have things going on in, you know, Atlanta. Why even care? And so I know um, I'll, I'll answer that question uh, in, in two different lenses. One is I think it's imperative, and I'm not even saying optional, I think it's imperative that we serve in the community that we live in. So this is not exclusionary at all. I believe in serving, I serve in local communities, I volunteer with local organizations, some big, some small, my church, I want my community where I reside to be the best that it can be. I also know that I'm a global citizen, 
and it's my duty to make a difference where um and all, where at all I'm called there will be people in this world who will never hear about Liberia who will never care who will never know and and so for those people hey if you don't know about Liberia if you don't if it doesn't impact you so you think that's fine but we learned from the Ebola epidemic for example that we live in a global environment we we learned that what we think is so distant is just literally one plane ride from one person away so everything we do touches our brothers and sisters also unlike any other african country in all of africa liberia was the only colony of the united states so that historical tie is undeniable and it's there the other thing is is when we're thinking about things that we can do to make a difference because of the historical ties there are connections between the united states and liberia first of all it's english speaking Second of all, institutions that are here in the United States also are there. For example, one of the biggest hospitals in Liberia is John, JFK Hospital, named after John F. Kennedy. I mean, it's, there is no magic to this stuff. It was founded by the United States. Liberia is exactly a model of that um, in, in many, many ways. And so if it's not your thing to serve anyone in your global community, then it's not your thing. But if you're missions minded, if you are um, a visionary and if you're strategic, you might care. The, the last thing I'll say is there's something about being first. And first means that you're a pioneer, that you're strategic, that you are one of those people who have vision. And right now in post-Civil Civil War Liberia, there are no public libraries in the entire country. We have public libraries on almost every other block in this country. And so the opportunity to be a part of not only the revitalization, but to be a part of a first in anything is remarkable. And so for those under the sound of my voice who that message does resonate with, I do want to encourage you to come out and, and see and help and build and be a part of a first because you know, apart from goodwill, there's something called legacy. And, you know, for me and for many people, it's meaningful to help build from nothing and turn it into something great. And so that's another opportunity, I would say. And I, I said that was the last one, but the, 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 the final thing is Africa is booming in terms of the different countries. Um, Liberia, I would say, is at the bottom of the barrel. And it's because of um, and when I say that, I mean not beauty and not aesthetics, but because they went through a recent civil war. Civil war, people don't know it in this country, but that means you're not going to work. That means things are not being traded. That means damage to buildings. That means so many that, um, people dying and family members displaced and you know going to refugee camps and so forth. So there's a complete disruption. Um, imagine what happened in, um, with Hurricane Katrina, and that was just one day. Imagine if that happened back to back for 20 years. What would you have left of New Orleans? Better yet, what would you have better, better left of Louisiana, Texas, and all the surrounding areas? It would all be gone or not look anything like what we can see today. So there is an opportunity um, to help. Um, it, the country is, is revitalizing, and most of Africa is. Right now, when you go, you'll be surprised there's, you know, Europeans travel to Africa just like Americans typically go to the Caribbean or to Latin America. And so it's beautiful, it's booming. You'll see people there that looks like you. It's not a great unknown. There are business opportunities. But again, we go from a perspective of helping our brothers and sisters get to the next level and um, to reduce poverty and change lives. That was so beautifully said. Yeah, I actually brought tears to my eyes because you, you are so right. We are citizens of this world, and that is something that we have to continue to remember. It's like we're not just people that live in these little communities. I mean, we are truly citizens of this entire world, and we all need to help and support each other because when one person's affected, it really affects everybody. Yeah, it does. And, you know, this is, it may not be immediate but you have a war in a country today, uh, or I, I won't even talk about war. You have economic crisis in Latin America today. Five years later, you have people piled up at the border, right? So it's not instant, but 
things that happen, you know, economically with business, with war, with famine, with, you know, um, droughts and hurricanes, they impact the world. And so we can't do it all. No, we cannot. And you can't help everybody. And even Jesus said, the poor will always be among us but you are responsible for doing your part. And I'll tell you a story. I went to work um, in Boston and I took a side trip after I finished my assignment to Rhode Island. I visited a church while there and the pastor preached a sermon about the importance of, of wisdom, of favor, and of doing our part. And so afterwards, he said something very, very powerful to me and moving to me. He said, I don't know why you're here, but I believe God sent you. So I want to pray a special prayer for you because I believe that God is doing some great things in your life to help people. And I want to be a part of that miracle through prayer. And I thought that was so powerful. And the reason why I say I bring that example up is because if you're listening today to this podcast, I'm not trying to over spiritualize it or say that you know, whatever, but you could have been a million other places. You didn't have to hear this message. And if it's tugging at your heart, it didn't have to. So that might be something to consider is maybe it was meant for you to be listening to this message. And maybe there is something within you that's pulling you to say, I want to do more. I want to serve. I, have, I want to have my legacy to be more than just taking care of me and my wife or me and my kids. I want to have a broader impact. I can make a difference. We have resources. And even if we don't have any money in the account, we can serve. We can help put blocks on top of each other to give people hope. We can do that. I can do that. And, and you don't have to be old. You could be a teenager and make a difference. There are kids who hear a message and go sell lollipops <laughs> and, and, and turn this whole world inside out because they're moved. So you don't have to be rich. You don't have to be young. You don't have to be you know, a professional or have a title to make a difference that's lasting in another human being's life. And in my case, I would love, you know, for the support. Um, if, you know, you're interested in learning more, my website is www.ledinow.org, um, which is Liberia Economic Development Initiative or L-E-D-I now, N-O-W.org. Um, check it out and see the work that we're doing. I mean, we're working with children. We're really making a difference. Now, what I wanted to ask you, so you've provided over 500 scholarships and then you provided micro grants. What are some of the incredible stories that you have that you could share with individuals just so people know what kind of impact this is having on people and how much it's empowering them? So, yeah, one of the things I can say is, I mean, that's a conservative um, estimate of the number of scholarships we've given out um, because we've been doing this work for, for over 12 years. But, you know, there was an Ebola epidemic. I'll give you one example in 2014. And many of us heard um, about Ebola from a distance or with fear or, you know, those people. But people in West Africa had never heard of Ebola. Ebola was something that was like, just like it was distant in the United States. It was also distant in West Africa. It had never been heard of. And in Liberia, it's a very communicable environment. People hug. They, there's a Liberian handshake where you know, people greet each other, they embrace each other. And overnight, people had to, it was very hard for people to adjust culturally. And so in the end, it was thousands, I think it was a couple of thousand, I don't think it was in the hundred, I think there was a couple of thousand people that lost their lives, maybe um, one to 2,000 people. And, and that's a guesstimate, I'm not, I don't have the statistics in front of me. But there were also a lot of orphans. Um, one example of a guy um, mysteriously his wife, he had, um, he had four children. His wife and 18-year-old daughter perished from the Ebola epidemic. But surprisingly, his son and the baby that was nursing, a nursing infant, they survived. Um, and and they, it was transmitted, you know, by bodily fluid. And how the baby survived is still to this day, I can't even explain it. So the, the son is an example of someone who um, has no way, like the stigmatization of a disease like that was one thing. Um, and so we find opportunities to support um, children who are in desperate need and who parents are already living in poverty and don't have a way out. 
Um, so that's one example. Another example I can give you, and this is not specific, well, I can give you a specific example to the scholarship. We got our country director who is in Liberia, got a call um, about a young lady who had been sleeping in the church yard, meaning like it, people find safety if they're homeless to go and camp in the parking lot of the church because they, they feel like nobody's going to harm them there. She had been, I don't know if she was raped or if she was attacked as if someone was going to rape her, but um, the, the pastor told our country director about her and that she um, didn't have anywhere to go and she needed a sponsor so that she would be able to go to school, that she was a very, like they would say, clever. She's a very smart girl, very clever girl, and that she needed an opportunity. And so what we do is when we are able to support a Letty Scholar, we matriculate them um, through college, through the first, um, through undergraduate college, um, or as funds will allow. Um, the reason why we do that is because in a poor country like Liberia, if you do not, if you just give a person a one-time scholarship and they're in squalor and poverty, you might as well have just wasted the investment because they won't have the money or the resources to support themselves. And those, we, we help those who are really desperately in need, the people at the bottom of the social economics um, status and really have no way out, truly those who are living in abject poverty. And so that's an example of one of our scholars. Um, an example of sacrifice is, you know, us working with the local community to build this modern public library. If you're able to come out, it's kind of like a habitat project. We build the blocks. We have the um, architects and different people out there. After our fundraisers, we um, use the funds to start the next phase of construction. And it's a beautiful thing to see all the people involved and and getting involved in that project and people from the local community and the women cooking and the men digging and you know just everyone involved. In terms of the micro grants, this is, is going to be hard for some people to understand or to even believe, but Imagine if um, there was a civil war and you uprooted with just the clothes on your back and it, instead of it lasting for a day or two, it lasts for 15 years. So many people lost skills, they lost their homes, they were displaced and so forth. So they literally have rock crushers, human rock crushers, who have no infrastructure, no capital, no nothing. So they go to these sites like granite, um, like Stone Mountain, where you have massive granite rocks and they chisel them down to sell to people who are building or doing construction because you have to mix rocks with cement to, build, to make building blocks. That's how they do it in Liberia. So these people are rock crushers, and many of them are female rock crushers. They're, you know, 25 years old, but because they do this back-breaking labor all day long, some of them are 25 and they look like they're 40, you know. Um, it's just undignified work. It's manual, it's horrible. And so we have videos of this on YouTube, but you know, some of our workers will interview them and say, what would it take to give you the hand up that you need, the help that you need just to have a viable business? Um, and most say between 300 US and 600 US. Some of them wanna start sewing, they don't have a machine. Um, some of them used to bake in their former life, but they don't have the raw materials. Um, so just those, being some of them want to sell cold water and sell water, but you have to have a certain quantity of water so that you can make a profit. You know, so seed capital is lacking for the, for the masses of poor people. And so what we've done, like you alluded to um, in the question, is the micro grants and business development training. So we haven't, because there's, so, you know, the, the ability, um, ability to pay back um, has, you know, we didn't, We've done it in the form of grants instead of loans, and because we didn't want grant um, a loan to be predatory, as we was, we saw in a lot of situations where people had difficulty paying it back and ended up being in a vicious cycle where it became predatory. So what we did instead was to provide training, coupled with support, coupled with the base capital, so that they could start on their own and, and get to the next level. And so we've seen great results from that, and people becoming economically empowered just by having a little bit of help. And I think it was Martin Luther King who says, it's cruel to ask people to pull themselves up by, the, by, the, by their own bootstraps who don't even have boots. And so all we're doing is giving boots, giving a, you know, and then helping them a little way so that they can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. It's interesting because it sounds like the people are like naturally entrepreneurs. 
Very much so. Everybody is a, in Liberia. If you go there, everybody is in business. The problem is scale. And the problem is living hand to mouth. Very few people are in a position to where they don't spend their whole day just finding food to eat for that day. So our goal is to help more and more people scale so that they can get to the point where not only can they feed themselves and their family, but maybe even employ others. But literally people spend their entire day just to survive. The average child in Liberia has one meal a day. The average. There are huge exceptions. There are rich people in Liberia, just like any other country. Um, a few middle class, but the vast majority are poor. And most of them have one meal a day. So it's, it's most of the day is spent vending. And people have businesses. You go, the, the streets are littered with business. It's, it's just, you know, the vision and the analogy I like to give is, imagine if you were drowning in a pool or in a, an ocean and people were looking at you and saying, hey, why don't you just swim? Just swim. You can do it. Just swim because they know how to swim. They have vision. They know what to do, how to put their hand in front of their feet out and kick, but you don't know how to. So what we're doing is throwing out a raft. Once that person gets a raft, they can catch their breath so that then they can think, okay, now how am I going to get out of here? Until you throw that raft in the water, they won't even have the mind to think about how to get out because they're literally just trying to stay above water for, for literal existence, not even like for anything extra, just to be able to survive. There, there are people who might be listening and they love what, you, what you're doing, but maybe they're thinking, hey, you know, I would love to start a nonprofit. Mm-hmm. What, what are some things that you learned through starting a nonprofit? And what, what are some suggestions that you would give to somebody who's thinking about maybe starting one? That's a really great question, and I appreciate you answering it. I mean, asking it. Um, the first thing I say, based on my personal experience, is if at all possible, don't duplicate the wheel. Find someone who's doing it very, very well and support them. And the reason why I say that is because people don't understand that nonprofits, one, are a lot of work. Two, there's so many administrative things that go on um, behind the scenes that have to be done from board meetings and minutes to, you know, certain filings with the IRS, so many different things. And so when I have an interview like today or on television, I get all these kudos and I can see young kids looking at me like, oh, I would love to do that. But they don't see that that's just one little dot (laughs) moment in time all the work that goes on behind it, all the late nights, all the sacrifice, all the different things. Um, So there's a lot of other things that don't show that's involved. So if you're passionate about a cause, find a reputable organization that is doing the work and support them. You can serve in various capacities. You can serve on their board. You can serve as a volunteer. You can give financially. You can do things. If you are adamant that you want to start a nonprofit, then I encourage you because if you are adamant and you've made up your mind, you know you're doing it or you have a niche, then go for it and go gangbusters. So one of the things I would encourage you to do is really, really, really think about your board of directors um, and make sure that they're strategic. So for example, if you are having a nonprofit that's based on helping um, clean the oceans, um, having people who know about, let's say, um, laws that have to do with, you know, marine animals or ocean warfare or, you know, different industry specific things, I would say is essential. Having people in your organization who are clear on helping you achieve your goals and your mission, I think are very, very clear. Going through the years in our, our organization, there were people who you know, either came on just for the show or just for affiliation or just to take notes so that they can start their own thing. You really need people who are truly passionate about, not only passionate about your cause, but passionate about helping you get to the next level and interested in working. And so there are different types of boards. You can determine the number and the size, but your board is essential. And then um, the last thing is finding creative ways from, you know, grant writing to fundraisers 
to, um, you know, one, get the word out and to raise funds. Um, those are the challenges. Most people like the cause, but they don't like to ask or solicit money or resources. You have to get in the business of making, getting comfortable with making presentations, with sharing your passion. And if it's truly your passion, it should be easy. Um, but, you know, all of those things are some of the most important things that I can think of that when you're, you're starting a nonprofit, you should you make sure to do the board is absolutely essential. A clear mission and vision that they can execute on is essential. Having means to raise money. Um, have, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a good grant writer, that would be awesome. And then um, getting your word out. So marketing and the different platforms and how you do that, that's also in, um, essential. Um, so yeah, those are some of the immediate advice, but if at all you can find someone to support and you don't have to reinvent the wheel, I would strongly encourage you to not do so because so many people I meet, um, they, oh, you, you know, I love your nonprofit. And then they say they want to do something very similar. And it's like, you talk to them five years later, they didn't do it. They didn't support you. They use it. Some people use it just as an excuse to not have to support other groups. And um, some people are passionate about it, but they just haven't had the time. So find a nonprofit you can support, but if you're passionate about it, go for it, do all the things I said, and then lastly, get a mentor um, that's doing it better than you or that you can aspire towards, and then let that mentor show you the ropes and continue to give you ideas and help you build and grow. And I have a mentor. I have more than one, but I definitely have a, a nonprofit mentor that, um, that works for a multinational organization um, or nonprofit that we all know of um, and I just use them for moral support I don't have a fraction of the budget that they have or the resources or the people you know but I can still learn and 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 grow and, and aspire to be as big as them one day that's very very helpful yeah because sometimes people might be thinking I'll start a nonprofit and maybe I'll get my uncle or some of my friends to be on the board and they really can't help them with what, what, what their, their mission is. So yeah, getting someone who's an expert and definitely look into other, other people doing the same thing. Cause there's like 50 different people, 50 different other nonprofits doing the exact same thing. Why not just support them and what they're doing? Find the one that you really, really, really like, and you want to help support them in what they're doing. So yeah, that's very, very helpful for anyone who's listening right now. How can people support you and your mission and how can they find out more about Letty and find you online as well? So, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for, for having me on today. Um, John, I really appreciate this opportunity. And for all of you listening who um, listened through this entire interview, I really appreciate you and your attentiveness to my message. Um, I'm all for the people and all for trying to make a difference wherever I'm planted, whether locally or internationally. And so I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity to serve through Letty. Our website is www.lettynow.org. On there, we have ways to get involved. Um, some of the ways that we ask is for financial donations. We ask for, month, for monthly donations. It can be $5, they could be $100, but just for people to continue to sustain their donations with us, it makes a world of difference. Another thing is, if you know of anyone in the construction industry anyone who believes in education. If you're willing to invite us out to speak to a group, a school, uh, to raise awareness, reach out to us because we frequently attend conferences, meet with small groups, large groups, religious institutions, organizations, um, just to share our message and to encourage people to get involved. The other thing is, if you are interested in service or you're just curious about seeing Africa, I'm learning about history or the history I described, the commonalities between the United States and Liberia, and you're curious and learning more, come along with us on one of our trips. It, it, what I found is that when people go, it's not what they expected in a good way and that they fall in love and they're like, wow, people are people are people. <laughs> Whether I'm in Asia or Latin America, whatever, people are people are people. And so when you see that commonality that we're not that far apart, like we paint ourselves in images or in stereotypes, then there's, you know, enlightening and education and mutual gratification that happens. And then the final thing I would say is share this with someone else, because sometimes you may not be the one, but you'd be surprised that one person that you know 
this could be an opportunity for them. And you may give them the opportunity to realize a passion that they have within to serve. And don't think of it just as an older person. Share with the kid. Maybe something that they learned in school will resonate with them or they might be interested in helping another child their age in Liberia. So all of that is on our website. We invite you to get involved. We invite you to, to donate and um, appreciate you listen to our message. So, and again, our mission is to reduce poverty and change lives. We do so one child at a time, one book at a time, and one library at a time. I love it. Thank you so very much for coming on the Power Your Voice podcast, Joanne. I really appreciate it, and I absolutely love what you're doing. It's, it's really, really beautiful. Thank you. I so appreciate much. you so much. Thank you for having me. This, this is a um, great opportunity and a joy. You're very welcome. Johnny here. Thank you for listening to the Power Your Voice podcast. I would absolutely love to get your feedback on this episode and how it impacted you. Reach out to me on Instagram by sending a direct message to username Voice Podcast. If someone in your life could benefit from this episode, share it with them and check out thepowerofyourvoice.com to read blogs on each podcast episode and learn more about what was discussed. And please, Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. This lets me know you find this show valuable. And thank you for listening.